Thanks, Dr. Smith. Yeah, we're going to pass around the communion plate, uh, so if you guys want to, I'm kidding. Uh, I've been in this role with philanthropy for about a month now, and was talking to Susan, and uh, I miss my extension role as a county agent. Uh, I really enjoy that time in Scott County, uh, but hopefully I can impact extension in a different way. Um, so in all seriousness, if, if you or you know somebody who's interested in supporting the college or Forge's extension, let me know. I'm happy to have that conversation with you. So I'm halfway through my master's program in science translation and outreach. Um, and so part of that, we have to do a project. And uh, Dr. Henning, Dr. Smith, and uh, Dr. Jeff Limcooler is are part of my advisory committee. And we got to talking about Baylage, specifically in Scott County. A lot of my farmers up there are looking at Baylage as an alternative. Um, they not only make hay, uh, but they have cattle, and they have families, and they have a lot of things going on, and they can't control the weather. Uh, so we're looking at baleage. Uh, but the one question I, I got asked a lot is, how do I know when to bale it, right? What's, I know we've heard this a lot today already, but what's that upper limit that we suggest on moisture content to, to bale our baleage? What's that percentage? You guys can talk, it's okay. 75, 80, is that right? No, what is it? 65, 60, yep, so, so the range that I usually gave my farmers was 40 to 60%. Uh, but how do we calculate that in the field? Uh, so this is where this stemmed from. We're trying to figure out how fast things cure uh, and wilt to get to that, that 60%. So here's my research question. How long does it take for different forage types to reach a moisture content of 60% after cutting and how accurate, accurately does a commercial moisture tester reflect this pro process? So you guys have probably seen these testers uh, out there. Uh, Agritronics is the one that we used, uh, but there's ones out there that a Winrow tester is what we used. Um, and so those tools, if they are accurate and precise, let's not let's use them. So where I was already collecting data on true moisture content, I said let's go ahead and test one of these probes. And so that's what we did. Uh, that was kind of a uh, a side uh, research project that it was really cool to look at the results, so we'll dive into that. But this whole conversation actually started when I took Dr. Henning's Forges class my first semester in grad school. He had me put some data together about baleage. And so as you can see here, I, I'm better pointing than using a pointer. So this is moisture content and lactic acid percentage. Here's our range of 40 to 60 percent when we recommend the bale for baleage. Look how many points are outside, wetter than 60%, and then we have points drier than 40%. And even within this range of 40 to 60%, most people are pushing down towards this dry rate. When I talk to my farmers, botulism is a very concerning word. Uh, you know, we hear the train wrecks, and so we want to avoid that situation. So they tend to want to bail it a little bit drier because they know if they get drier, we don't see that clostridial formation like we do in wetter baleage. So it may not get as good of a fermentation, but that's the, that's the risk they're willing to trade, or that's the trade-off they're, they're willing to have uh, to not worry about botulism. But if we want to have a really good fermented baleage, we probably need to be pushing that 60% line. So uh, there's a, obviously a lot of factors that go into that, but, but this was just a, a brief study we did. Here's my procedures. Basically what we're doing, we're taking samples every two hours. Um, and that doesn't sound like a lot, but then you get out there and you do four replications at one time. You know, you don't have much time to eat lunch. I'll just say that much. And when it's 90 degrees outside, it, it's not a, really a fun day. But nonetheless, taking samples every t two hours between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Each sample, we did four replications to get my data points. We, we, uh, we averaged those out uh, to get that one data point. First, we use, uh, you can see down here, this satellite-looking dish. It's not for TV. That's the Winrow Moisture Pro that we're using. Uh, you push that down in a bucket at a certain pressure, uh, and we had a scale underneath it to make sure that pressure was consistent. We get that moisture reading there. We then bag up at least a third of the forage. We take that to a big dryer on, on our north farm, dry it down, run it through our moisture calculations, get our true moisture content, uh, and then we can, can graph those out. At baling, what I did, we wanted to use a different probe. That, it's a probe that you actually stick in the bale 
it's, it's a, a high moisture probe. So I would sample five bales with that moisture probe, average those out, and then we'd get, get that data point. Uh, and then I, I'd use a core, uh, and we would core two cores out of each of those five bales uh, and take those through the drying process to get our true moisture. Here's the process and pictures up top here. This is the bucket. Actually, these are Dr. Henning's pictures. They're a lot better than mine that you'll see. Uh, but you put it in a bucket here. We then put it on a scale, and you can see that he's uh, pressing down uh, to get that consistent pressure uh, with the probe. Um, and then we'd, we'd bag it up, record that weight, take it, take it and dry it, record those numbers. Uh, this is agent down in uh, Madison County, Brandon Sears, and uh, that's just an example of how we would core those bales uh, to get those core samples. So the first one we did, uh, this was a sorghum Sudan grass uh, field. As you can see here, this is actually it, and you guys got the picture back there. Um, so there's definitely variances uh, on how this grew. You can tell this is a little bit thicker up this way, and then you get thin. Uh, but that's a typical field, right? We're not necessarily going to get always uniform stands. So basically my process is, is I would pick four wind rows. I'd stay in those four wind rows until we got down to our, our belling date, uh, and we kept on moving back in towards the field. This graph, the blue dots represent our uh, tree moisture content, okay? Uh, I made a curve based on those points. Uh, and what you're looking at is moisture content percentage on our, our axis here and then hours after cutting. Red lines represent midnight. So we started sampling. It was really wet forage. Uh, and if I remember correct, there was a lot of dew down that day, and that's why it's so wet. But you can tell here, not much dry down uh, on, that, on day one. We go into day two, and you see some big variances here. What we've kind of determined, uh, based on some other forages we've tested, uh, when I was sampling, I'm just pulling grab samples out of these wind rows. And when you got a really thick wind row, if you grab from the top or the bottom, that's going to really affect your moisture content. Uh, so that's where you can see some of these big variances here. Um, and, and I'll discuss later how we're going to address that this next, next summer. Um, but we're drying, drying down. Uh, but our 60% line, if you drag it all the way out of here, it took 50 hours after cutting to get to 60% moisture content on sorghum Sudan grass. And these were good drying conditions. If, I'm, if I remember correct, it was around 83, 85 degrees that day, or those two or three days. Uh, and I, well, I'll get to this whenever we look at the moisture probe. But good drying days, took 50 hours to get sorghum Sudan down to our 60% moisture. This last point here is our, uh, our core samples that we pulled out. Um, so that's that last data point there um, at bailing. You can tell my pictures aren't as pretty as, as Dr. Henning's, but this was my setup in some forage soybean baleage. Uh, not very common to, to see necessarily, but this farmer here, he likes, to, he likes to try everything. So I said, well, let's take some data on it while we're out there. Uh, this was my setup here. Uh, you can tell my bucket, moisture probe, there's a scale underneath this piece of plywood to keep it level. And actually, I collected weather data. Uh, we haven't done anything with that yet, but we have that with us. Uh, so I was collecting weather data while I was out there. Forage soybeans, this was a better day. It was about 89, 90 degrees. Um, and you can see how big of a variance here. We talk about wind row sampling. Uh, that may account for, for why we see such a variance here. But if we go down to our 60% moisture content, it took right around 18 hours to get to that point. At bailing, we were right 56, 57%, and that's our core samples out of those so forage soybean uh, bales. This is out at uh, Spindle Top Farm, uh, Main Chance Farm. You can tell I 75 here, um, and this is actually Dr. Henning helped me pull these samples. I said baleage here. This is actually, we, they went ahead and made dry hay out of this, this alfalfa. So you'll see this graph looks a little different. So day one, um, really good drying conditions. We got all the way down to 50% on day one. So if we're making baleage, here's our 60% line. You know, right around six, seven hours, we're already ready to bale if we're making alfalfa baleage. If the weather says we can't, we can't cut and bale dry hay in the next you know, two or three days, and you need to get that cut because of quality, 
You got good drying conditions, you could possibly cut and bale on the same day and have good quality forage ready, depending on your market. You know, if, if you're feeding this to your cattle or, or neighbor, neighbor's willing to buy it from you. You know, in Scott County, that can be difficult. We got a lot of people producing horse hay. Um, and so finding the right people to, to sell this baleage to. Day two, um, you can see there was a little re-wetting re overnight, which we, we see uh, dried down to 30%. And then we all went down to day three, and baling happened right around 14% moisture. This is out in the sorghum Sudan field. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this was my little setup. It was actually, this was, I think, about three weeks after Campbell was born, Dr. Henning. I, I was on my paternity break, but still had to be uh, committed to my project here. Uh, but uh, you can see, I think this was day two or three after things were were um, were, were cut. Actually, this was day two because we weren't bailing yet. Um, so this graph can get really messy. If, so let me explain it first. Our blue line here is going to be our moisture content. This You've already seen this. What I added in is our tester average. So using that satellite dish that Agritronics makes uh, is, is how we tested this, okay? Now, you can see big variances here. We're about 20 points off drier as we went, went on. Now, you can see that it's, it's pretty precise. It's picking up these differences, right? But it's not as accurate. Uh, I forget what class I was in, but imagine a bullseye. Precise and accurate means you're hitting the middle of that bullseye every time. Precise, you may be hitting the same spot, but you're outside the whole target, right? You're hitting the same spot, but you're outside the target. Accurate, you're all in the, in the target, but you're not in the same spot. So what I mean by precise, it's picking up the, the variances, but it's not accurate. It's not lining up with the same moisture content that, that the true, uh, that w when we dried down and made the calculations, it's reading. Yes, this is the wind row test, except that last point. Good, good, good comment, Susan. This last point is that bell probe we used. All right? So um, that last point's the bell probe. The, what I was going to tell earlier, this, this farmer I was dealing with, um, he was one that liked to, to bail on the dryer side. And he's, he's done baleage for several years. So I remember pulling these samples out on this day too, and we were getting down, I mean, 45%. Granted, I didn't know what the true moisture content was. And if I was basing my recommendation off that moisture pro, I was saying, let's get this stuff bailed because we wait another day, you're going to be way too dry. And he was very hesitant. He said, this is too wet for me. So there is an art to it. You know what you're doing. You know what you're bailing. You can tell uh, while you're out there if you do it many times. Uh, so we ended up bailing right at 60%, which he thought was still too wet. Uh, but... Uh, we went back and did a nutrient analysis on it. Some of the best baleage he's made, uh, and the cows ate it up. Here's our forage soybeans. <coughs> Same line here. Blue you've already seen, which is our, our true average moisture content. Orange is our tester average. Uh, this is our bell probe, and this is our wind row probe. Precise but not accurate. Still tw about 20 points off. Uh, on our, our forage soybeans. Here's our alfalfa tester. I switched colors on you here. I don't know how I did that. Our blue is actually going to be our, our tester here, and our orange is our, our moisture content. So whenever it was wetter, it was still 15 to 20 points off. When we got into day two here, it saw some get a little bit closer in, in um, accuracy. Um, but then we get to day three, you see some differences as well. We didn't use a bell probe with our alfalfa, um, but th these are this is the wind row probe all three days. So in discussing these scenarios, Dr. Henning and, and Dr. Smith and Dr. Limcooler, when that probe goes into the bucket, especially in these thicker stem forages, there's a lot of air still in there. You can't compress that forage as tight as you'd like, like it to be. And so, you know, what we think may have occurred, you know, we're still, we're still uh, trying to figure out, is that it wasn't truly registering all that moisture. It was still in stalks. 
uh, especially in these, these summer annuals. Um, when you get this alfalfa, especially as you get in a, a drier point, you can compress that a whole lot more uh, than maybe your sorghum sudans and forage soybeans. So based on our uh, summer of studying, granted this is three data points, uh, alfalfa dried down the quickest uh, to get the 60% 60, 60, 60 moisture five to six hours. And then that moisture tester had big variances against tree moisture content. Our biggest differences were in the wet and thick stem um, forages. I'd be, be curious, uh, it might be worth reaching out to Agritronics or, or, or whoever it may be, to have the discussion as how do they calibrate this. I would imagine it would probably be based on grass and alfalfa hay. Uh, we were probably pushing it to the extremes working with sorghum sudan and forage soybeans. The last point, wind rows varied in moisture from top to bottom. So you can see Dr. Henny, whenever he took this alfalfa wind row, he basically got the whole wind row. When I was pour, pulling a sorghum Sudan wind row, I, made, I, I still had plenty of forage left on the ground. And so those variances from the bottom to top were really noticeable whenever I was pulling my, my, my samples. So what kind of conclusions did we make? Based on our limited results, Moisture tester was not very helpful to our farmers. And then next steps, we're going to continue this in the next summer. Uh, even though I'm raising money, I'm still going to get out in the field and, and uh, pull some samples. But I'd really like to see a winter, winter annual um, or a small grain. Um, I, I got some people growing some winter wheat uh, that I may look at. Or, or actually, I talked to a guy yesterday who's looking at spring oats. Uh, so how do those compare? Because uh, we'd like to see that data poke. Point, a lot of people are, are using those winter annuals uh, and small grains uh, as baleage. Um, and then improve uh, sampling methods for the windrows. So instead of doing random samples out of a windrow and not knowing if you're pulling more dry matter off the top or, or wetter forwards in the bottom, how can we cut a, cut a windrow and get everything from top, top to bottom in the bucket so we get a representative sample of the windrow? So I'm pushing lunch. I think I might have caught us up. That was good. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Dr. Torch. I'll let Jessica answer that one. I didn't deal with those specifically.
Yeah, yeah. Mm hmm Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 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 I don't know. I I haven't thought about that, but we can we can definitely look at it. <coughs> right. Yep. I I don't know. I we, we had used the Winrow Pro because that's what it was advertised as is for Winrow. Uh, but I can see people utilizing their bell probes. So it, it it read up to I believe it was seventy five or eight eight percent uh, was was as high as it it, it advertised uh, the the bell probe we used it was a high moisture bell probe and it rate it I think it might have went up to eighty yeah yeah so it it was the, it it was advertised as a high moisture it could pick up high moistures because some of those bell probes are designed only for dry hay so. His his uh, past experiences, yeah. Well, the the initial goal was to find out. Hopefully, we can determine. Well, if we cut on this day, Sorghum Sudan should be ready on this day. And I had a bell, I had a Winrow probe in my office. I said, well, let's go ahead and throw this out here and see how accurate it is too. Um, because if it's accurate, then let's use it, right? Yep. So, yeah. So we we go ahead and bail, bag that sample up. Uh, you weigh it. Obviously, tear out your your bag weight. Uh, take it and dry it down. I think for two or three days uh, to make sure you get all the moisture at, out. And you subtract those. Uh, put it through a formulation to get true moisture content um, based on based on weight is what you're going off of. And you said actual dry matter. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we're weighing in the field and the uh, using the same scale whenever we take it to the dryer.
they, they were off as well. Let me go back here. Oh. So this last data point is the bell probe. So this would be the bell probe versus that's at a pretty high moisture. So sometimes those bell probes say that you have a higher moisture. Does that kind of make some point? This one, this one was advertised as a, was it? a high, high moisture. Yep. Okay. Yep. Same here. This was that same. So I guess the long and the short is if you're going to try to check it at these higher moistures, then it would be better to check yourself with the microwave or a pump dispenser to make sure that it's actually uh, you're going to try to do a lot more follow up and how they've actually done the calibration and the distance. So as long as you use for alfalfa, alfalfa grass, rather than pumpkin sand, so the report next year. That's right. That would kind of make sense. Dr. Gary? Mike talked about what helps you know the temperature of weather. Uh -huh. That's what we're going to try to correlate uh, the dry and regular season. As far Help me out. I'm, oh, okay, weather parameters. Yes, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I mentioned we did take weather samples. Uh, I haven't really dove into that. That's a lot of data points. Uh, but maybe looking at temperature, humidity, uh, solar radiation is going to be a big, big factor. Looking at past research, it may not necessarily be the temperature. If it's if it's hot and cloudy, you know, does you're not going to get that solar radiation at the bottom of that windrow. So looking at those points and possibly even soil moisture, we've talked about uh, if we can look at how maybe a soil, the moisture in the soil affects that forage as it sits on that ground. So 